Okay, well, we're gonna get going. I did wanna share that we are um, going to be joined by one more panelist in a few minutes. We have uh, Fanny Kamanga from Malawi who is navigating a few unexpected bandwidth challenges this morning, but should be joining in just a few minutes. Um, I wanted to again, thank you all for joining us for today's town hall, leadership as a lever for change in the wake of COVID-19. Did want to remind everyone once more that we are recording this um, meeting today and that recording will be shared with all the registrants um, after the event. I also wanted to just say thank you to the Global Health Core team for inviting me to moderate today. I'm really um, just really happy to be part of this important conversation. I'm Lauren Rangel. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Government External Relations for Ed Talum Global Education. Ed Talum is a leading healthcare educator and a provider of professional talent to healthcare industry. I'm also the Vice President and the Secretary of Ad Talum's Foundation. And we at the Foundation are so proud to partner with Global Health Corps to advance health equity and strengthen health systems. Since the pandemic hit, there has been you know, an increase and a lot of support for both of those areas. But what has been a bit less explored is the role of leadership in making health equity and systems change realities. So that's what we are going to talk about today with our wonderful panel. You know, as the pandemic has showed us, um, there are really important roles that leadership plays in order to improve lives, particularly during crises. So, you know, COVID showed us that viruses don't care about borders, right? We need folks and leaders who are going to take that global lens and really collaborate across lines um, in order to make that change that's needed. And you know, additionally, it's an ecosystem approach. It's an all hands on deck situation. So we need to build and equip diverse leadership early on and often in their careers about how to respond and prepare for these types of crises. So with that, I am honored to in introduce our panelists. We have first Charles Romini, a lifelong advocate for health education at the intersection of race and youth. He joins us from Washington, DC, where he serves as Associate Director of Health and Compliance at KIPP DC. He joined Global Health Corps as a fellow in 2015 and was a project manager for the Grassroot Project. Welcome, Charles. Next, we have Mary Ajwan. She is a public health specialist with over 10 years of experience in clinical and community health programming. Like Charles, she joined as a Global Health Corps Fellow in 2015 and went on to become a founding member of Voices for Health and the D Prize winning group Koi Koi Stories. She's currently program officer at UNAIDS. Hi, Mary. And finally, as I mentioned, we will have panelist Fanny Kamanga, who I think is still working to join. She is a community M health specialist at Partners in Health, an organization she joined as a Global Health Corps Fellow in 2020. Her work focuses on supporting community health workers with digital health solutions that improve community health outcomes in Malawi. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so happy to be part of this panel and to be talking with all of you today. So I'm going to begin with a lightning round. Um, and I, I'm looking at my notes. I see Funny has joined us. I don't think she's able to join on video, but she is here. So she is gonna join in that conversation. Um, we're gonna start with a lightning round of questions for our speakers on um, you know, how leadership development opportunities have impacted their own careers. And I want to take this time before I start the questions to just remind you all in the audience, please share your reflections, your questions in the chat as we're going. We will hold most of those until the end for a Q&A second, but um, we, we definitely welcome those comments as we're going, so please share them. Okay. So with that, we're gonna jump into the lightning round. These questions um, for all of our panelists, I'd like you to hear from each of you on this one. Why did you join Global Health Corps as fellows? And what did you take with you from that experience? 
Um, Sunny, if you're available, let's start with you. Thanks, Elaine. Um, and hi, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I won't be able to join um, with the video. Um, so um, I, I joined Global Health Core um, as a fellow because I wanted an opportunity where I can grow my skills in the field of, of global health. So um, my professional development is in the field of environmental health, but then I previously I've never really worked um, in the field of, of global health. And when I looked at the fellowship, I thought this was an opportunity. This was an opportunity for me where I could grow and develop my, uh, my profession in that area. And the other issue was that um, looking at global health, um, it's a fellowship that also provides leadership development. So um, I think that, that this is also something that I needed in my career development to grow um, both um, as a leader and also to develop professionally in the field of global health. Wonderful, thank you. We're so happy that you're able to join and we can get your insight. Uh, Mary, I'm gonna to go to you next. Why did you join Global Health Corps? Um, thank you, Lauren, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mary from Uganda, and I'm speaking from Kampala. And so um, my career really began um, as a frontline healthcare provider. And I worked um, mostly in rural Uganda from central Uganda to northern Uganda, which is a region that has experienced over 20 years of civil war and continues um, to experience the after effects um, of the war. So while I worked there, um, my passion really is with children. So I worked in the pediatrics um, section and every day I was um, uh, faced with over 80 um, very sick children, most of whom came when were really um, at advanced stage of disease. And, and yet most of these diseases are preventable from malaria to malnutrition uh, um, and um, effects related to um, HIV and AIDS. Uh, and so with, with this experience um, I, and how overwhelming it was every day, I wanted to be involved in a way where, where I could um, prevent this disease and be um, engaged in health promotion because unfortunately I lost many of, of, of these children and yet this was really preventable. So this really sparked my interest in um, public health and I went on to pursue a master's in public health and following that um, master's, um, uh, the Global Health Core um, Fellowship really offered um, a bridge um, from my clinical work um, to where um, my passion really was in, in prevention. And, and, and health promotion, equity, social justice, and health um, as a right for all really sparked um, a major interest in me to, to join. And I went on to join um, as um, um, a program coordinator with Save the Mothers, where I worked um, with um, uh, various hospitals across Uganda, um, training um, midwives, doctors, nurses in, in disease prevention and health promotion. And really there's a lot that happened during the fellowship from leadership um, growth um, to programming uh, and improving lots of my skill set. Um, but really what I took away, um, what really stood out for me was the networks. I, I made lifelong friends. Um, one of them is Akopano, um, Charles, and some of my best friends really um, are, from, are from this experience. Um, thank you. Hey, Charles, your turn. <laughs> Sure. Uh, I think I think Mary said I joined Global Health Corps to meet people like Mary. <laughs> uh, she's one of my one of my best friends from the fellowship. Um, and really, um, you know, uh, I joined Global Health Corps. Um, I was really looking for a way to make an impact. Um, a lot of the work that I did um, before I got to Global Health Corps um, was around uh, youth prevention, HIV, AIDS, um, sexual health. Um, and, you know, just going through a few years working in those areas really, you know, open up your mind uh, to some of the, the issues um, that come with working in, in urban spaces. And um, after that year, um, I, was, I was working um, kind of in those areas, I was looking for a way to make an impact. And I found Global Health Corps it just looked like a great opportunity to connect with great um, leaders from around the world. Um, really sharpen some of my skills and then take those back to my community immediately and make an impact. Um, in terms of 
you know, what I took from, you know, the experience, you know, I really learned a lot. I met a lot of great people. Um, and I really learned that um, the world is, is, is big and small at the same, at the same time. Um, it's big in that we, we travel, you know, long distances. I remember that flight to Uganda was, was, was long that I took that year. But it, it's small in that, you know, you meet these leaders from different countries and you have conversations with them and they have a lot of the same challenges uh, that we have miles and miles away. Um, so it, it just kind of helps you understand that we're all in this together. We can all learn from one another. Um, and that's, that's how, kind of how the world is small. So it was a really interesting year. And that's one of the things that I took away from. Great. Well, and then just a follow-up question to each of you as well. Now you're all alumni of the program. You know, what has being part of this broader community really meant to you, the different resources available to you, as well as the network that you all, a uh, few of you have already mentioned? Charles, I'll go back to you. We'll go opposite. Sure. Um, you know, being, being part of this community really means a lot. I always feel that I have access to um, a group of, of highly trained, highly skilled individuals who can help me solve um, problems. Um, you know, in the, in the COVID-19 you know, space was really important. Um, this was new for everybody. So um, kind of reading up on, um, you know, techniques and, and methods that, you know, different organizations, school systems, health systems were using to combat this global uh, pandemic was important. And um, the GAT community was so busy during these years doing, you know, creating resources and, um, and providing support to their community. So being a part of this community, I was able to just learn on the fly to really help, you know, my community um, here in D.C., um, here in DC, in the DC health education space. So um, it really meant a lot. You know, I have a constant pipeline of resources and friends that I can call on to, to support when I need it. Thank you. Mary, how about you? I know you mentioned the network earlier, but you know, just what other resources and, and positives have come out of this for you as, as now an alumni? Yes. Yeah, so, so really um, with the networks, um, there's been both technical and, and, and personal resources that I've gotten, but I'll give an example um, uh, with this, um, with, the, with the current pandemic, um, when I joined um, UNAIDS um, to support them uh, with their COVID-19 prevention efforts. Um, one of um, um, the alumni uh, who's Tracy um, Kobukindo, I think she's on the call, um, she was really resourceful in, in helping me navigate um, um, the sphere around COVID-19 in Uganda. Um, she linked me up to resources, technical working groups, um, and all that I really needed to, to hit the ground running. Also, we have um, various um, um, levels of access um, to, to different things from jobs um, through the GHC community portal. Um, um, to other resources really. Uh, we also have the GHC Alumni Uganda WhatsApp group, which is very resourceful as well. Um, so the, the community really con like continues um, to, to, to give back um, 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 as much as possible. Um, thank you. Great. And funny, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation if you could answer as well and let us know uh, how the community has helped you. Um, so GXC uses this phrase where they say, once a fellow, always a fellow. Um, um, I feel like I've, I've seen that um, after being after joining the alumni community. So um, I'm just looking at the network that, that is there, like starting from the co-fellow, even people that are still, that, that have been part of, of the GSC community. It's very easy for you to actually reach out to them in case you need something to something. Um, and also, um, in terms of training, there's also like continuous training that um, GHC supports. Like uh, personally, I've ever been, I've ever done one of the trainings in um, management, which has been very resourceful in the current work that I'm doing. So yeah, it's it's pretty much very resourceful in terms of um, the continuous training that you get um, post fellowship as well as the support that you're able to get from from your from your fellows as well. Great. Well, thank you all for that lightning round of questions first. I'm gonna switch and start asking just a few more um, specific questions to each of you individually on our topic at hand. So Mary, I'm gonna come to you first. 
you, you know, as you shared, you got your start on the clinical side of healthcare and then shifted to more of a program focused role through your work with Global Health Corps. Um, as you got into deals with the fallout from COVID, um, what leadership traits are most important to cultivate in the nation's rising leaders in health, both from the clinical and the non-clinical perspective? Um, thank you for this very important question. Um, first off, I think um, as leaders um, in global health, um, we need a passion. Um, people, um, leaders should keep um, the fire burning, but also help others um, to keep that passion um, through inspiration and, and different ways of motivating them um, by recognizing excellence. Um, for example, in Uganda, <clears throat> uh, we see that the backbone um, of our healthcare system is, is nurses um, who are really in the grassroots, and a lot of and oftentimes this, they, they go unnoticed. Um, um, as well as community health workers that are really working with very limited resources. Um, and so they, these need to, to be um, kept motivated. And, and, and as leaders, we have to find ways um, of, of doing that. Um, then second, um, we need accountability and, and transparency. Um, we've seen a lot of corruption. Um, so many of my examples will be um, Ugandan or um, at least um, African. And we, we saw a lot of misuse of funds um, during the COVID-19. Um, um, really, it's still ongoing, but um, really at the start of it, um, a lot of resources um, were collected, um, but these didn't go to where the need was. Um, there was a lot of corruption, um, but as leaders, we really have to find ways of, of keeping accountable and transparent um, to our people. Um, the third is equity. Um, really um, how do we keep fair and impartial and how do we ensure um, that the resources are really provided to those that need them um, the most um, and this could be from recruitment um, to, to, to interventions um, um, that, that we carry out um, who needs them most what's the mo uh, what's the greatest need um, with the limited resources that are available um, and then the fourth is really um, compassion and empathy um, we saw that um, with the, the, the pandemic, um, we had families um, that lost four to five members in just a short span of even less than a, uh, less than a month. Um, how, uh, how, as a leader, how can you, how, um, can you walk um, in, in the shoes of, of such a person um, um, rather than being um, far, far, far removed um, um, from the situations that people are going um, through. There was so much um, that happened, really, loss of jobs, loss of people, and, and really the, the needs of people really changed. And, and how do we um, continue to be um, empathetic towards people as we're in these leadership positions? And then the fifth is advocacy. Um, advocacy really for yourself, um, for your co-workers, and even the people that you serve to see that the greatest um, needs are, are provided for, uh, um, but really and um, being a voice to the voiceless. And lastly, um, being human-centered. Um, we, As we carry out our interventions, in, in, whether clinical or non-clinical, um, how do we ensure that the needs um, are tailored to, uh, rather the interventions are tailored to the needs of the people and rather than use a one-size-fits-all, which doesn't really work. Um, so those, those are my contributions and thank you. Great, yeah, that, that's, that's so important, that human-centered aspect of it, right? Understanding the needs of the different, um, you know, different regions, different communities, and making sure that we're really being equitable in how everything is divided between that, which leads me into my question for Funny. As a community and health specialist, you focus on supporting community health workers in hard to reach areas and then implementing um, interventions to support and inform service delivery to those groups. How do you approach building trust with community members in your work, which you know that trust is so important in this type of, um, of element. And then you know, why, why does this matter for effective leadership in your space? Um, thank you, Lauren, for that question. Um, I'd say for me, the first thing is um, humility. Um, as well as being an active listener and being empathetic with the people. So um, the thing about working in the community, um, it's somehow interesting because you're working with people that are based right there 
And in one or the other, I think it's good to admit as a leader that besides maybe you, I'm having the capacity or knowledge to, um, to bring ideas to them. They are somehow in a way that they know most of the things that are happen, that happen in the community. So um, um, the, 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 the first thing for me is to also show interest and that you and that you also care in the outcomes of, of what they're implementing and not show them that you're there because it just need to be placed in at the moment. So like becoming part of the community itself for them to understand that you have interest in what, in what they're doing and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's also important to you as much as it is important to, to them. And also the um, other thing um, on that also is to is also to, to consider that you might have the ideas and knowledge you're not implementing what you want, but then um, them as people that are in the community, they have an understanding of how the community works better. So being an active listener is also very key um, in, that, in that capacity. And the other thing is to also ensure um, um, there is um, continuous mentorship and training between what you're bringing to the community for them to implement so that they have that capacity to do um, what they're doing. I um, mean, one thing that I always carry with me as I'm doing work um, in, the, in the, the community is also um, this specific training that we had from Global Health Corps, which was on authentic leadership. So um, that also helps me to make sure that in the work that I'm doing, I'm also creating room for other people to bring in their ideas. But at the same time, I'm also staying focused on what needs to be achieved whilst I'm being accommodative to what, what they're bringing in. Yeah. Uh, that's an important element, you know, understanding that, you know, they, that there, it's not just us or our folks, right, going in and, and providing these solutions, so to speak, we're really trying to understand what their needs are, um, you know, seeing their perspectives and understanding their needs so that um, things can move forward. It's great. And Charles, I want to come to you as well. You work at that intersection of health and education, as you mentioned, which is so near and dear to my company um, and very much of interest to me. So you know, you've had that close up view of how these sectors are intertwined, um, important ways that can advance or potentially also hinder uh, equity. So how is working across those different disciplines important to your own leadership style? And how have you been able to you know, cultivate that capacity, whether it's through your global health core work or just the career that you've developed? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, working across, um, you know, these two sectors, health and education have really allowed me to um, bring the most out of my leadership style and, and really identify what I do best. Um, a lot of the work that I do kind of working across these two sectors is about breaking down the silos, right? And, and helping people understand um, that there is a symbiotic relationship between health and education, right? That you have to focus on, on one to get the most out of, out of the other. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's the, the strongest aspect of my leadership style is the ability to, to see the people first and, and work with the people first and bring people together. Um, so, you know, naturally working across these two sectors, I have to, you know, work with a lot of different stakeholders um, with different perspectives. COVID-19, you know, specifically, you know, brought a lot of challenges. Um, we had to work with government we had to work with our hospitals. We had to work with, um, you know, stakeholders within the school system. Um, and I was really challenged with bringing all these people together, right, who, who speak different languages um, and, and, and getting them to see that, hey, we all have to work together to solve these, these challenges that COVID-19 brings specifically. Um, and that was just great for my leadership style. And it, and it helped me identify that that's what I do best um, and I'm, I was able to focus on that. That's what I can bring to the table. And, and I'm able to fill in the gaps with, with people in my community. Um, and yeah, I've, I've been able to cultivate um, that capacity um, really through leadership development, um, programs like Global Health Corps, other leadership development programs that I've done have really helped me identify what I do best. And, you know, you really understand that you can't do everything. Um, you can't, you know, you know, trying to, when trying to solve these these issues, you can't fill every role, 
But as a leader, if you know what you do well, um, and you know how to communicate with people, um, you can you can solve problems. Um, so for me, you know, in, in my leadership style, it's really been about bringing people together, um, being a people centered leader, um, and then finding all of the different skills that are out there in the community to solve a problem, bringing those people together, and and um, and you know solving that problem. That's. That is right on track with what Mary and Funny were saying as well, that I love that people-centered piece of this. And uh, Mary and Funny, I'm going to open it back to you. I think you know, Charles was great in providing a little example of how that trait and his the strengths that he's developed as a leader really came into play during COVID in particular and the different work that needed to happen. Do either of you have examples, um, you know, similarly of how the, the different leadership traits and styles that you've developed um, have, have really allowed you to make those needed connections during these last few years? Mary, I'm going to go to you first. Okay. Um, I, I, I think I, I will share um, um, what um, it's been around my role um, during COVID-19. Um, and I think something that I learned um, during um, my fellowship, but also that has continued is really versatility and adaptability. Um, and I, I think that really came out for COVID-19 because we were faced with something so new um, that no one had experienced before, um, but the world had to adapt very quickly. Um, and so um, I carried this forward um, in my work and, and really as a person that represented um, my organization um, at, diff at, diff at diff different panels uh, and that were working to allocate resources to the greatest need, um, I, I experienced a lot of that because then I had to advocate um, for areas that did not need, um, that rather needed um, more clinical, um, um, clean, needed more clinical personnel um, or areas um, where people, persons living um, with HIV needed um, support um, with food because um, then we know that um, if they do not um, have adequate uh, nutrition, then um, the medication would not um, work effectively. So this really brought a lot of, um, I, I had to really adapt to different situations because um, it wasn't the, it wasn't the normal, um, and I saw that uh, my adaptability um, helped me a lot. Um, thank you. Funny, how about you? Any examples on your end? Mm -hmm. um, for me, one thing that I learned um, from from this was adaptability as well. So, um, with the coming in of COVID and working with um, community members. Um, it was an issue of um, checking on how best can we adapt the work that we're doing to make sure that we're still able to deliver what we need to deliver amidst the pandemic, and also how do we keep um, the community health workers themselves um, even safe as they're supporting in, in implementing the work that we're doing. So um, it, it was a very, it was a challenge, but then um, I would say, um, like I've mentioned about adaptability, it really um, helped me the most because um, it is a thing that um, as a team we're able to apply in terms of um, the tools that we use and how we also deliver the work. So like, um, what do we change um, in terms of how um, these community health workers help um, um, implement to, to keep themselves and also like how do we um, align ourselves as a team to make sure that we're still able to deliver what we need to deliver. So yeah, that was my, my key lesson on the leadership journey. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Charles one more time, just in case I gave the others another another shot to, to weigh in with examples and things. Anything else come to your mind in that same vein? Um, I, I, I don't I don't think so. I think I was I was able to share, um, you know, that that main example of, you know, the challenge of of, 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 of bringing people together um, during COVID-19. And um, you know how my leadership style um, uh, kind of fit with that, and 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 how I was you know just kind of a natural fit. So I, I wouldn't necessarily add too much there. Okay. Well, thank you all again. I'm gonna send, do a 
quick reminder to everyone um, in the audience, please start dropping in some questions into the chat, anything that's come to mind so far or that you'd like to hear uh, from our wonderful panelists. We're gonna ask a few more questions, but then we will switch over to a Q&A session in just a few minutes. So please go ahead and get those questions rolling in the chat box. Okay, and now my remaining questions are really open to all three of you. So please um, feel free to jump in. If not, I will of course call on one of you to, to get the discussion going. But um, first I just wanted to you know, start talking a little bit about the up and coming folks into the healthcare space. You know, what advice would you give to those individuals, those young people who are looking to pursue a career in global health? I'll come in. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd say um, first, um, I'd say cultivate a spirit of volunteerism um, because we know for most of these opportunities, um, uh, a certain amount of years of experience is needed. And the best way to get that um, would be to volunteer. And many young people really these days we see want to grow to managerial levels. Um, but it's best um, that, that you, you humble, you're humble enough um, to take on um, the, the entry level jobs, but also if those are not available, go, go on, be confident enough and ask for voluntary opportunities. And then the next is network, network, network. Um, um, so look for opportunities um, um, uh, and look at icons or people that you think um, you'd want to be like, um, use LinkedIn. Um, I think it's a, a very good um, platform. Um, but there's also um, other areas like Rotary, Rotaract, where you probably may meet um, like-minded people, as well as um, other fellowships um, that may be available, webinars. Um, and then the other is invest in, in knowledge, uh, invest in learning. Um, you need to know what the current trends are, what are the statistics, what solutions are available, um, and, and things like that. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I can I can add to that. Um, <clears throat> definitely uh, agree with uh, Mary's point about about learning and, and taking time, um, really just to learn. You know your local context um, and whatever you know subject matter you're you're, you're dealing in. Um, take time to learn and, and be open minded um, when it comes to. Um, a career in, in global health. Um, everything is changing. Um, and, you know, you really, like Mary said, you want to be humble and, you know, you want to be able to receive information. Um, and I think only then you'll have an opportunity to solve problems if you can you know, be an individual that, that knows how to receive information. Um, uh, and another thing that I would add is, is you know, just if you're not a, a people person, um, you know, try to to do your best to learn how to work and deal with people. Um, a big aspect of, of leadership is, is, the, is the, the people aspect. Um, you know, we can't get it done by ourselves. So you, you do have to have some type of, of skills or some type of way to, to, to reach people and, and to communicate with people. So um, that could be through informal conversations, that could be through mentorship, um, you know, that could be through some type of formal education, learning how to speak with people, but that, that skill is so important to getting things done in this, in this global space. So I would say definitely, if that's not something that, you know, is a natural skill for you, you know, try to seek out those, those people skills in some way. Thank you, Charles. And funny, I saw you were trying to jump in. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say um, networking um, is very key. I mean, also always looking for opportunities for you to learn and grow. And, and the other thing I'd say is um, it's very fulfilling working in the global health sector. But then I think um, one also needs to define the purpose and know what they want. Because um, sometimes you'd, you'd get so, you'd get exhausted, I should say, because there's always a lot to do. But then when you look at the work that you're doing and, and it's centered around something that you really want to do, that's motivation enough for you to keep on, on going. And also admitting the fact that there will always be somebody that will know better than you. So 
you should be teachable and you should be willing to learn from others. Wonderful. Well, that, that is so important, that idea of motivation and keeping ourselves going. I know that especially during um, you know, these crisis situations, but just in general, working for equity, it, that is a challenging thing to do. And it's very much a long game, right? It's not something that you, know, you, you take one step and all of a sudden it's fixed. It's gonna take time and we need to keep at it and keep going. So how do each of you stay motivated? I know Fanny just shared a little bit of that, but um, you know, just in that broader sense, what keeps you going? How do you make sure that you are, are staying on the path and, and keeping the fight going? I'll, I'll jump in. <clears throat> um, I think it's two things. I think first, um, I think funny, you know, hit the nail on the head um, when she said um, being purpose driven um, is something that when you do get exhausted, when you do, you know, get tired, that purpose will always bring you back in, in some amount of time, right? It might not be, you know, immediate. You, sometimes you may have to, to take a break or step away, um, but that purpose will always bring you back. I know for me, you know, I, I'm in my life just naturally um, um, driven towards issues of, of race and equity you know, where, whatever, if I'm having a conversation, if it's, if it's health related, if it's, more, you know, more in a general social context, I'm just really interested um, in that aspect of, of inequality and, and race. And I'm always learning about different ways to, to solve that uh, or, or, or support people who are, are kind of in that space. And um, that always brings me back. Like, that's my purpose, right, is, is to, to support people um, who deal with some type of inequality. Um, and I learned that about myself and, and that's, e that's able to keep me on track. And the second thing um, is, um, you know, I always go back to that, that thing that kind of fulfills me. Um, it's, it'll be a personal thing. Um, for me, it's family, right? And, and I think the pandemic really, um, you know, taught me about the importance of family and community. I, mean, I, I need my family, I need my community. I need them to be healthy. I need them to be strong. So when I do get burnt out, um, when I do have to put my head down and say, I, I don't know what's going on, you know, I always have my community. I have my close friends. I have my family to kind of help me recharge and, and, and get back on track. Thank you. You're so right. You need that, that piece, whether it's family or something else in your life, right? That just really is driving you um, to keep going. Mary, how about you? Yes, um, <clears throat> for mine would be um, for self care. Um, I love my sleep. So I try and do at least eight hours a night. And if I can't do that, then I find ways of compensating. Um, but then I also try and exercise. Um, and then, like Charles said, um, family and friends, um, just really trying to, to apportion um, enough time for them. But then also, really key for me is meditation and prayer. And three times a week, I go to fellowship um, at my church, and, and that really keeps me grounded. Um, yeah, and I think the most important thing really to be, stay motivated is to follow your heart. Um, what is it that you love to do? Uh, and then it's really hard to, to burn out when it's things that, that make you come alive, or at, at least it keeps you, uh, it keeps you going. And thank you. Wonderful. Okay, well, I think I see a few questions starting to come in through the chat. So we're gonna switch for a few minutes and, and start answering some of those. I do wanna just remind everyone again, please feel free to keep those questions coming. We'll try and get through as many as we can in our, our next 10 minutes or so that we have. I'm gonna look through these now and, and see if I can grab a few that, that, make, that we can answer here. So, um, Here's one, we have, how much of an impact has the COVID-19 pandemic had on progress in combating other diseases, maybe through vaccination or education programs? And what methods have been employed specifically in African countries when um, gathering in crowds is ill-advised or 
uh, maybe internet access is limited in order to get those those solutions to cross. And of course, you know, any any examples that you all have from your own work, I think would be much appreciated. Anyone want to jump in? Any thoughts? Um, yes, um, I will um, I'm coming. Uh, so with the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'll, I'll speak more about um, the work that I do. I was um, working um, with UNAIDS, which really works um, with, with HIV and AIDS. Uh, we saw that we were dealing with a double pandemic um, of COVID-19 and of HIV AIDS, um, one that was new and one that was ongoing. And we saw that a lot of work um, that, had been, that had been done around HIV was really starting to retrograde um, um, because we saw that um, like um, patients that needed to access the antiretroviral medication could not do that with um, the strict lockdowns that were happening in country. And then there was, there was a lot happening with lots of jobs, as I mentioned earlier, and, and people could not um, access basic needs like food which would really affect um, their, the, um, the potency of, of, of the medication um, in their bodies. And, and this was not just uh, around HIV, and there was really retrogression in areas um, like maternal and child health where um, mothers feared to go to healthcare centers to deliver because they feared they would catch um, um, the, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, and then other areas like malaria, where we had made so much progress, um, was starting to be deprioritized. And unfortunately, there was um, there were so many um, losses around that, uh, in addition to, to the losses that were happening with COVID-19. So in Uganda, the, the, the Ministry of Health came up with um, a, a group of, of, of technical people that were working intentionally um, to ensure that there's continuity um, of, of healthcare services. And um, I happen to sit on, on, that, uh, on that group and, and we saw ways of, of how to continue to engage um, healthcare workers, continue to train them. Uh, how would we engage community health workers who would bridge that gap um, that had been created of access um, uh, between communities and, and hospitals. Uh, and so that really helped um, to, to help us um, deal with the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm seeing here a, a number of questions coming in about early career opportunities. And, you know, as you all mentioned during the, the earlier part of our conversation, sometimes those early, or early career opportunities can really lead to you developing your own leadership style too, right? So um, can you share maybe any tips on and how you found one about trying to find those opportunities for yourselves in order to, to grow your own leadership? Um, I can jump in. Um, I mean, you know, we, we mentioned volunteerism a, a few times and, you know, just starting there, it's, it's, it's the easiest way to, um, you know, gain a little bit of experience and, um, and meet people and, and network at the same time. Um, it's, it's so important, you know, for me, I was, I was before I got into, you know, global health and um, school health, I was on a very different track, but, you know, global health kind of piqued my interest a little bit and, and I, I volunteered. I volunteered, um, I think, at like Operation Smile or something like that, just to kind of understand, um, you know, what healthcare work was about, what this global health education work was about, what health education work was about. And it just started to snowball from there. Um, I met a lot of people um, and I got on the phone with a lot of people. And, you know, when you build that network and when you leverage your network, you know, you can get pointed in a lot of different directions. Um, in this whole thing, you want to give yourself time. You know, it's nothing that's going to happen overnight, but I guess the, so the sooner you start, the sooner you can get success. So really focusing on volunteerism, informal education opportunities, right? Definitely go and get the degrees and things like that. But, um, you know, those informal education opportunities can be help and, and building that network and staying in touch with the network is just going to create an environment, I think, where positive things happen and opportunities come. Yes, Fanny, I think you're trying to weigh in. Yes, 
Um, I just want to comment on what Charles said on, on orientalism and um, I think in any opportunities even small when they arise. Um, I wanted to say that um, one one important thing for me that I advise on that is um, also knowing how to pitch yourself, knowing who to talk to, and how to yes, and how what exactly to say about yourself. So whatever opportunity that you have, no matter how small it is, making sure that you 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 make the best out of it and you do the work um, with the best as if as if it's the last time you're doing it. So that also um, actually helps, uh, helps for you to be able to nice out day for people to even uh, give you other opportunities. Thank you. Mary, anything from you? Yes, I, I think I'd advise um, um, people to be bold. I'll give an example of um, after the Global Health Co Fellowship has really um, interested in, 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 in growing um, my advocacy skills, uh, especially around social and reproductive health and rights. And um, I didn't have a platform. Um, however, um, there, were, there were different organizations. So I boldly went to them with my CV and like, um, like Fanny has said, um, they pitch. So I shared with them what I could do, um, what, um, what my experience was, what my education qualifications were, and I, I offered to volunteer with them. And so uh, they gave me an opportunity. And one month into volunteering, they were happy about what I was doing. And then they, they took me on full time with full benefits. So be bold. Wonderful. Great. Well, and I do also want to call out, I believe Global Health Corps um, folks in the background had shared in the chat some details about if you're interested in joining, um, you know, just a link to their website and some details there. Um, they're, I believe, hiring for some positions as well if you're interested. So please do that. And then I see we have a hand raised from Heather. Heather, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question, feel free. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, thanks again for facilitating this call. And Mary, Charles, and Fanny, it's lovely to have you on today. So just a big heartfelt thank you and for your real continued commitment and dedication um, as part of this community um, and in the work that you're doing. I appreciate it. Um, my question for any of you, all three of you, is really, you know, as you know, at GHC, We've always talked about our leadership practices, that this isn't something that you perfect, but that it's really showing up every day. And you've all touched on some of the different GHG leadership practices that we talk about. Through the lens of sort of the influence and mobilizing, I'm curious how you've seen um, an ability. Again, you've talked a little bit about it, but I'd explicitly love to hear more about how have you used those skills, um, particularly if you've seen others who haven't been as potentially adaptable or flexible? Have you really worked to help um, influence others and potentially even thinking about those that are in different positional powers, meaning your supervisors or others in positions of influence? I'd love to hear your thoughts. So thank you again. Thanks, Heather. That's a wonderful question. And I was gonna ask one very similar because I agree. I think that that second piece is so important, right? How do we impact um, it's not only the young people that you all answered wonderfully about earlier, but it's also the people currently there. What do we need to do to, to start impacting those mindsets as well? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the way my brain is set, it, it's always to go back to um, this concept of building relationships. And sometimes I feel like that's all that I have. Um, you know, with, with right now, um, kind of still in the pandemic and, and trying to navigate so many, um, challenges in the work that I do specifically with, you know, trying to keep students healthy and school nurses and vaccine hesitancy. Um, it, it sometimes it just feels, you, you know, you don't have anywhere where to go, you know, you, you need to call on so many people, um, in so many different sectors with different skills and different mindsets. And, um, you know, there are some times where I feel like I can't reach out to this, this important stakeholder, you know, that I need to get something done. Um, you know, something is in the way. Um, maybe, um, 
you know, their leadership styles clash with mine, our communication styles just aren't meshing together. And I always go back to the best tool that I have in my toolbox is building relationships. Um, let me try to relate to this individual. Um, let us try to find some common ground so that we can, you know, move that notch um, today. And maybe if we can continue to do that, we can find some a way to communicate with one another and a way to work together um, in, in service of this greater, you know, issue whatever that may be. So I would just go back to, you know, building relationships is, is, is always a strong way to, to bring people together and change mindsets. That's so true, Charles. Mary, you're funny. Yeah, um, I'll weigh in. Um, so I think one thing that really, um, my first exposure to um, was during the fellowship and, and that was um, the, the power of storytelling, the story of self as and now, and, and really how do we appeal to the emotions of people to, to enable them to buy in? Um, and, and how do you use um, the visually compelling uh, uh, means, or not just mere statistics, but how do you weave in a story to be able to, to capture um, the hearts of people? So I, I've used that um, a lot um, in my work. Funny, I see you're off mute. Feel free to, to jump in. Um, yes. Um, for me, um, what, I, what I've used the most is um, I'm making sure that um, I build relationships with other people, as well as um, ensuring that I have, um, ensuring that the people that I work with will sort of, um, have a common goal of purpose that would want to achieve in a way. So like the work that I do, um, it's more focused on dealing with, uh, like I've mentioned before, it's more focused on dealing with community health workers. But in the end, um, the main aim is for us to um, actually contribute towards um, clinical outcomes. So it's not something that we can entirely um, implement on our own, but we also need to bring in um, other people, especially from the um, clinical sector. So um, it's an idea of um, selling the thing that you're doing to other people to make sure that even people within the organization are interested in, they also understand what you really want to achieve. So that way it's been easy to um, mobilize or to, to easily work with people from other departments as well to achieve what we want to achieve. Cool. Thank you so much, Fanny. That, you are, that is so accurate, right? We all need that, that just shared goal and it, whether it's, just your own team, or in the much larger global sense, when we have that shared goal and everyone's thinking from that type of perspective, that's how we make a difference. That's how we get change started, right? So with that, we are unfortunately out of time for today. So thank you all again for joining us and sharing all of your wonderful thoughts and feedback. Um, this was a great panel. Thank you all again. Um, we've covered so much. I loved hearing about how we're breaking down silos and really the importance of that human-centered, passionate leadership that's needed in this space. And it sounds like you all at GHC are really, really driving that conversation, which I love to hear on my end too. So I hope you all learned something just like I did. Maybe you made a new connection. Maybe you can um, you know, just take some of these ideas back to your own team. And I hope that you really consider how that you as an individual, no matter where you are in your career right now, can um, either grow as a leader or maybe invest in rising leaders that are on your team. I think you know, we need that. We need those types of leaders that we've talked about with these wonderful traits um, in this global healthcare space. You know, whether it's for right now with the pandemic, we're still still battling or as we're preparing for potential future health crises. Because as we've learned, you know, it's who leaders are and how they're operating that really matters for those health outcomes and equity that we're looking for. So if you wanna stay in touch with Global Health Corps, I believe um, the team is dropping in some contact detail right now. So please feel free to, to grab that from the chat and then uh, you know, check out their website. And, and get connected with that team. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Bye.